Welcome to Convocation. We're glad you're here with us today. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce our speakers today. Uh, as you can see by what's up on the screen, we have a special day coming up. Tomorrow is a Earth Day. And in honor of Earth Day, we've invited our speakers to talk about some of the environmental concerns we are facing in the West and in our nation and what is being done to protect the land, air, water, plants, animals, and people. Dave Pacheco, a fifth generation Utah from Salt Lake City, is the Utah grassroots organizer for Southern Utah Wilderness Alliance. His focus is education individual groups in support of protecting the remaining wildlands at the heart of the Colorado Plateau. In his own time, Dave prefers hiking, paddling, bike touring, and quiet recreation in the western U.S., especially the Red Rock country of southern Utah. Eli Johnson is an environmental advocate, undergraduate honor student, and intercollegiate soccer athlete, and convocation student. He has a passion for environmental conservation and believes that in order to combat difficult issues such as the climate crisis, we need to focus on preservation and sustainable new practices. His current education focus is on acquiring skills and knowledge to help promote social justice and equality for all. Please join me in welcoming Dave Pacheco and Eli Johnson to the convocation stage. Uh, first, I just want to say thank you. Uh, Thank you to Professor Bodrero for giving me this opportunity. We're super excited to be here um, and really excited to be able to share what I think is a super important message uh, to all of us. So like she said, my name is Elias Johnson. Um, and yeah, just to get into it. So as, as was mentioned before, Earth Day's tomorrow. And a lot of you might ask yourself, well, why is it that we have a holiday dedicated just to the earth. I mean, it's like, yeah, we live on it, it's important, but what, is it, what does it really mean and why exactly do we have that? And I think oftentimes we take the earth for granted. We realize that, yeah, it's important, but it's just, just the place that we live and there's not much to it besides that. But, but on, on the contrary, that it is like, it's important that we care about it. Um, and to really understand this and understand the history of Earth Day, um, we need to go back and understand what's going on at, at, at this time. So in the 1970s um, and six, the 60s and 70s, they had some of their own environmental issues of their own. Um, and these consisted of uh, species becoming more and more endangered due to like super harmful pesticides we put in the, into, into the, like, onto the ground, such as like DDT. It resulted in like eagle eggshells becoming super brittle causing them to die, uh, super harmful to a lot of different species, as well as to humans. Uh, there was also a bunch of toxic pollutants being put into our water, into rivers. This picture right here is a, a river on fire, so, so bad that it, it actually caught on fire, um, as well as just terrible air pollution um, throughout major cities and all across the United States. And well, what got done? So young people, just like us, realized that there was an issue. Um, that, that was going on, and, and they noticed, like, well, this isn't right, there's this injustice, and we need to do something about it. Uh, so they began to speak up, they began to acknowledge that there was this big problem, and that they need to do something about it. So, so they began to protest. They, they went out, they, stri they, they striked, they, they said, like, no, this is not okay, we need to, we need to treat our planet better. And that's exactly what happened. Um, there we go. Yeah, so, and then this shows right here, millions join Earth Day observance across the nation. Um, yeah, so that was the founding of Earth Day. So they, they had their own environmental struggles, challenges, and they overcame it because of uh, them coming together and realizing that there's something bigger, more important that they need to focus on, and then they were able to create this, this holiday that we enjoy that we're going to celebrate tomorrow, um, which is Earth Day. And this wasn't the only thing that got done. So, as well as Earth Day, there was also tons of legislation that got passed. Uh, this is super important legislation that we still use today. So, such as like the Clean Water Act, um, ensuring that there's good, like clean water across our country. Clean Air Act, something in Utah, like we often struggle with air pollution that helps combat that. 
uh, the Wilderness Act, one that's super important to us as an organization of the Southern Utah Wilderness Alliance that we focus on um, a lot, which protects public lands. And, and in Utah, we have a lot of those public lands. Um, the Endangered Species Act. You can, you can see that all of these acts kind of coincide with um, the issues that were going on at the time. They did a good job of acknowledging what their problems were and then how they were able to fix it. So I, I'm super grateful for, for this, this, this past history um, in our country that they were able to make so much environmental progress um, that what I think is to be super important. Um, so following me learning this, I, I would go out to places, some of my favorite places in southern Utah, beautiful Red Rock, and, and just be so grateful uh, that there were future generations before us that, that ensured that we have beautiful places, um, beautiful places to go. And for, for a while, I thought, well, this is perfect because everything we have um, is, is good, and because of the work that other people did before us that we have solved all of these problems. But like many of you probably already are aware, uh, that's not the case. And I started seeing um, things like this, and that became like more alarming to me, um, as, well as, as well as this. Uh, like the Amazon on fire, like we heard a lot about that, saw that all on social media, um, houses being flooded. So I started seeing these things and I was like, well, these are, these, these are new problems that I haven't really understood before. Um, and, and well, what's going on? So that's, so that's why I asked myself, well, something clearly is not right because that is not what my first picture looked like. That's not like the beautiful earth that, that we have. So something can't be right. And I've learned to know that that is in fact what we now call the climate crisis. That is the cause of those images. Um, and, and that's the root of our environmental issues is what we now call the, the, the climate crisis, right? And the climate crisis, to really understand it, we first need to understand a little bit of science. And I promise it's not too science heavy, so just bear with me for just a little. All right, so the way this works, the way our planet works, it's cool. We got, a, this, we got this planet floating out here in space, um, and we have this super cool atmosphere that makes it so we can live on it, so it can sustain life. And the way this atmosphere works is that it's a gassy atmosphere, mostly consisting of CO2, that's super important um, to regulating the temperature on our, our, on our Earth. And energy comes in from the sun, uh, goes through our atmosphere, and then reflects back off, and some of it gets shot back out into space, but some of it stays. Um, and that stuff that stays is what keeps it at a good regular temperature. Um, so it's super important that we have an atmosphere, and if, if it wasn't for our atmosphere, there would be no uh, like life on this planet. So it's important that we have it, but what, me, well, what we maybe didn't know is just how uh, delicate the balance of the gases in our atmosphere really is. Um, so we started collecting data, um, in like the 1960s is when this starts, about the CO2 levels in our atmosphere. And you can see starting uh, in 1960, going to 2020, which is pretty much to where we are at now, we've increased by almost 100 uh, parts per million of our CO2 levels, uh, which is a drastic increase in what, what normal or would say regular uh, amounts of CO2 in our atmosphere were. Um, and scientists, they, they've started to learn. They learned that, well, maybe when we increase the, the, um, the amount of gases in our atmosphere, that then more energy that comes from the sun starts to get trapped inside of it, which is going to result in like warmer temperatures on the Earth. And this is exactly is what was happening. So you can see that in 1960, where we, our other graph started, that there's a, like a direct line of correlation um, that goes up along with uh, the, the rising temperatures on the Earth. This is from like four independent uh, sources that both have been tracking the temperatures of the Earth, and you can see the increase that goes along perfectly with the amount of like CO2 in our atmosphere. Um, but you can see here, well, it's only about one degree Celsius. Um, and you could say, well, that's not that much. That's not a very big increase. One degree Celsius, like who really cares uh, about one degree Celsius. Well, the Earth's getting warmer. We can see by that graph, it's getting warmer, at, at least what we would think would be a very small amount, but what does that really mean? And the truth of the matter is that that's actually very important uh, and very dangerous to our planet. So increased temperatures globally 
result in all these very dangerous uh, effects of the climate crisis, right? And these being more severe storms. So storms will increase in severity and frequency um, and put at risk uh, many of like us and, and, other, and other habitats that can be affected by it, as well as increased drought. Us here in southern Utah, uh, in central Utah, that's something that um, we, we worry a lot about. We're always worried about the amount of water we have in our watersheds. And increasing that drought will only further the issues around uh, the already pressing drought that we're facing in our area. Um, as well as a warming rising ocean. So the warming rising ocean will not only affect the species inside the ocean, but as well as there's m like millions and millions of people globally uh, that live on coastal cities and that will put them at, at risk of displacement um, and just, t t just millions and millions of dollars lost uh, from, from things being uh, destroyed through the uh, increase in uh, sea levels. Um, it's also gonna result in decrease in biodiversity, which this is like there'll be less species, less uh, diversity among species. And we're, it's important that we have species because as humans we look to them for all sorts of things. We like looked for new development on drugs. Uh, the way we interact with them tells us more about us um, as, as our own uh, species, as our own like type of animal, it tells us more about us. So it's important that we have these to be able to learn and understand us better. Um, as well as we just won't be able to provide enough food for our growing global population. Um, and then lastly, and very importantly, is that it's going to result in increased poverty across the entire globe and displacement of millions and millions. And what's really unfortunate about that is that it's going to affect the, the poorest um, and, and the most impoverished already. So it's, it's not equitable. The climate, the climate crisis is, is not fair. And, and that's and just another reason why it's so important. Well, we can see that it's pretty bad. Um, rising temperatures are not great. So now, uh, and uh, unfortunately, our, our, pro our parents didn't solve this, this problem. And you might say, well, that's a little, like, why, why is it their responsibility? Well, for a while we knew this science, and it's been pretty clear. Um, we knew that the CO2 in our atmosphere would lead to increased temperatures, which would then in return lead to these, like, issues that we've addressed through the climate crisis. Um, but for whatever reason, uh, there was a fail of action. We, we were, they, they, did, they didn't step up, and they didn't... Uh, face these challenges the way that they needed to be done. But no matter uh, the reason or for whatever cause, uh, we now, it's, it's now our problem. It's now our generation's responsibility um, to, to take on this challenge head on. Uh, not because we may want to uh, or we feel like we have the desire to, uh, but because we have to. Because it has to get done and it's going to have to be our generation that does it. Um, and there's, there's an example I like to, to use when I'm talking about this, and it's a scripture. It's in Deuteronomy 6.11. It says, we drink from wells we did not dig. This usually refers to um, uh, it, the idea that, that we are, that we are um, on the shoulders of giants, that, that we have inherited a planet that's, uh, and, and a life that's been better than anyone. Has, has ever lived, which is so true. We live, in, we live in a place where we have more access to technology than ever before, where um, we have like the highest uh, lifespan. All of these things are, are the best that, that have ever been for humans ever. And we're so lucky for all of the people that have gone before us to give us a better, a better place to live. But that doesn't mean that we have inherited a perfect planet like, like has been shown before. Um, in some cases, the wells that have been dug for us have been riddled with like climate disasters, inaction, um, and, and have led to some serious problems that need to be address, addressed. But it's time for us to now dig wells for future generations. We have to dig wells better uh, for our environment with more sustainable practices, with, with the earth in mind more. We have to be more conscious about the way we behave. And it's going to be us doing that for future generations, right? Just, just like our, the people before us gave, us gave us this amazing life that we have. We need to do that for, in, in return, future generations. Well, what can we do? What, 
what can us as Snow College students, uh, as, as young people, what, what can we do to have our, our, our voices be heard and, and then try to solve this super difficult issue? Um, and the first thing I would like to talk about in regards to what we can do is, is what's already going on. Right now, uh, young people like us all across the, the whole world, uh, millions, are, are gathering together and they've seen this injustice. They know what's going on. They, they, they've, been, they, they've understood the, the issues around our environment and realized that something needs to change, and they're speaking up about it. Um, they've realized that for too long we've neglected our planet and, and that something needs to change. And although this is good and we need to keep up these loud voices, it can't end here. This is not enough to solve the problem. We have to do more, and it has to be more... We have to do more as individuals as well. And so these are some other things that us as individuals can do um, to do our part to help combat the climate crisis. Uh, some of these being we can vote for elected officials uh, that are going to prioritize the climate, that are going to take it seriously and realize that we need to put in immediate legislation that's going to ensure that we protect our planet. And that's super important. We need to be very vigilant in who we elect and understand that these people will make policies that are going to affect us and future generations. So we need to be very, very conscious about who we're electing and voting for. Um, you can also reduce your own carbon footprint. There's a lot of ways you can do this. You can uh, drive less. We already do pretty good at that. We walk pretty much to every class because it's a small campus. It's easy to get around. So that's already a thing that we're doing pretty well at. Um, you can uh, just try to like eliminate your waste, pick up trash, like simple, simple things, eating lower on the food chain. These are all like little things that you can do as an individual that will, um, that will help, help in this cause. And then as well as that, uh, you can support organizations that devote their time and resources to bettering our planet. One being the one we're with is the Southern Utah Wilderness Alliance. And there's actually something that you can do right now that will help us. So in your little packets that you guys all got, if you open up, uh, to the, like, the first page or something. You have little postcards in there. Um, and these, these postcards will be sent to uh, our representatives here in Utah that, that are uh, to say that you are in favor and in support of public lands um, and why it's important that they care about it as well. So that's something that you all can do right now is pull, it out, pull those out, fill them out, and then we'll collect them from you on your way out if you're interested. Um, and, then, and then lastly, we need to keep our voices being heard. Uh, we know, we know what the right thing to do is. Um, and there's going to be people that will try to tell you that, that what you're doing is wrong, that it's not necessary, but, but that's not true because we know that what we're, what we're doing in this fight for, the, for climate justice is the right thing. So we need to keep our voices being heard and we need to, to keep up the fight, the action, um, in order to ensure that we get the results that we want, right? Um, and just, just to really reiterate this again, that this planet that we have, uh, we're so lucky to have it, but it's really the only one we've got. If, if we fail to protect um, and to ensure its safety, then, then that's it. We only get one try. There's no planet B. And in this, this climate crisis that we're facing right now, it doesn't care your political party affiliation, doesn't care who you are or where you live, uh, how much money your parents have, whatever, it doesn't matter. The effects of this, of this issue will, uh, they, they will come true if, if we don't act. Um, so I encourage you that it's now our time and responsibility to act. Because like I said, we have to. It has to be our responsibility because if we don't, then no one will and then we're going to lose this fight. But I'm confident that, that all of us, we can act and we can make this, this, uh, this planet better for all of us. Uh, but it's going, to, it's going to take hard work and action. But, but yes, it's something we have to do. It's our responsibility. As, a, as our generation, we have to do it. So I'd like to uh, shift gears a little bit now um, and introduce my uh, good friend and colleague and mentor, Dave Pacheco. He's someone who's devoted his uh, whole life to trying to, to better our planet and then just protect uh, public lands here in Utah. So uh, I'd like to welcome him up to the stage, and he's going to continue on from here. Um, but yeah, thank you. I got one. Oh, I'll get it back. All right, just 
Working? Yeah, I presume it's working. Um, well, uh, thank you, um, Eli. You're a tough act to follow, um, but I'll do my best. Um, I want to say thanks to Cheryl uh, Bordrero uh, and the Convocation Lecture Series for uh, letting me speak in front of you today. I uh, really appreciate your coming, your attention, your interest. Uh, again, I'm Dave Pacheco. Uh, I am, live up in Salt Lake. Uh, my mom grew up right up here in Spring City, uh, so I'm very familiar with the area here. Uh, I love coming down. I appreciate the invitation today. Uh, I'm going to work a little bit from notes, uh, unlike Eli, who's got it all here. Uh, there's a few facts and figures I wanted to make sure I, I gave to you. But to get things started, I just wanted to give you an idea of what it is that the Southern Utah Wilderness Alliance does. So as you could kind of guess, we are interested in wildlands. And Utah is a pretty big place. Utah is the eighth largest state in the country. We have 54 million acres of total land base in the state. And I want to focus in on some specific lands for you. The Bureau of Land Management is a federal land management agency. And because two thirds of Utah is federally owned, the Bureau of Land Management is actually the biggest of those land managers. And they are in charge of a lot of, a lot of land. So uh, they manage 42% of the entire land base of Utah. But what we focus on here at the Southern Utah Wilderness Alliance is 40% of that BLM land. That's the amount of land in Utah that's still in its natural condition. And on the map here, you can see it's those brown areas on the map that are qualifying as wilderness land. Those are the lands that are in legislation before the US Congress to officially designate as wilderness. The legislation is called America's Red Rock Wilderness Act. And I'll refer to it as the Red Rocks Bill kind of throughout the talk here. But that's really where we're focused on is those specific parts of the BLM lands that are still in their natural condition. And what I mean by that is that they don't have roads. They are primarily driven by the forces of nature as written in the Wilderness Act. And those lands total for the state represent about 16.7% or about a sixth of the state's land base. So that's what we're talking about here, about 16% of the state's land base. These lands are important to protect for a lot of reasons. And Eli just went to kind of the two biggest ones. And it's where I'm going to also focus today on climate and biodiversity. Those are the kind of the biggies that I want you to understand and take away. But there are other reasons why wilderness is important that we're really not going to touch on today, but it, they're worth mentioning. One of them is kind of the spiritual value that we gain from being in a wild place. I mean, I can't explain it to you. You know what it is. You get that feeling when you're out in the wilderness. Uh, there are wilderness all over the place right here. Right above uh, Utah County, there's the Mount Timpanogos Wilderness. Uh, further on north, you've got the, along the Wasatch, the, the Mount Olympus, the Lone Peak, uh, the Twin Peaks Wilderness, and then the more uh, widely known one up in the northeast corner of the state, the High Uintas Wilderness. These are designated wilderness by an act of Congress. We know what they are. They have that kind of spiritual, intuitive value. But they also have their own values, too, right? Values that we can't put on them, right? They have kind of intrinsic value. They're their nature, the way that it has always been. And I don't know really how to define that. That's kind of up to each of us individually. But they also have that kind of own individual value as well. And to address Though I want to talk really about the specifics of the climate and biodiversity. And to address the climate crisis, uh, we need to both drastically reduce the amount of uh, fossil fuels that we're burning, or rather putting CO2 into the atmosphere. And at the same time, we also need to pull more of what's already there, that curve that Eli showed. We need to, we need to really reduce that curve that's already out there. So we need to do both of those things simultaneously in order to combat the climate crisis. And what the point I want to make to you is that protecting lands here at home simultaneously addresses both of those crises. I want to explain in detail how it does that. <clears throat> so it permanently keeps, it, by designating wilderness, you say that those lands aren't going to be developed. Right? We're going to leave them, let nature's course run. Right? So you permanently protect those lands and you keep the fossil fuels in the ground, because there's a lot of fuels, a lot of fossil stuff under the ground here in Utah. We need 
right? We have a, car, a, a county called Carbon County, right? I mean, it's, it's pretty obvious there's a lot of it there. What we need to do is keep it in the ground and not burn it. By doing so, all of that carbon in Utah that is underneath these lands specifically that we're talking about, that 16.7%, the amount of carbon underneath those lands represents 5.7% of the global carbon budget that we need to not burn in order to stay at that 1.5 degrees Celsius rise in order to really give ourselves a fighting chance as humanity, right? So it's big. Utah is actually a big contributor to this. If we leave it in the ground, we don't burn that and we contribute to the solution. And I think that this legislation, I, I like to look at this legislation as kind of low hanging fruit. Uh, it's easy to actually pass a law that says protect this land and don't develop it. It's a lot harder politically to actually get it done, but the technique of actually doing it is, doesn't really take a lot of effort compared to say things like trying to burn less carbon, trying to move the economy towards more renewable resources. Those things take a lot of time. We could instantly help the problem by just designating wilderness and protecting it. And I also want to say that last month, internationally, there's a panel called the Inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is the heads of all the science departments across the world who come together and produce these reports. They stated just earlier this month in their most recent report that have to do everything. Everything's on the table, right? All the little steps that we take, and when you think about it in the big picture, protecting the lands in Utah that qualify as wilderness, that'd be one of those easy it's one of those low-hanging fruits. We've got to take everything into account. Everything's important because of the severity of the problem right now, and it's only getting worse. So protecting lands in America's Red Rock Wilderness would also increase the sequestration and storage of carbon. So it's not only are you not burning it in the first place, but by leaving the lands intact, you give the planet more of an opportunity to pull carbon from the atmosphere, to sequester it and store it in plants. Right? That's what trees do. Right? They respirate carbon. Right? And most people, when they think about carbon sequestration, think about um, like the tropical rainforests uh, down in, in the Amazon, right? Or the, here in the States, the, uh, like the North Woods, the temperate rainforests, uh, and also like up in the Pacific Northwest, right? That's kind of where our mind goes when we think about sequestering carbon. But I want to make the case to you today that it's really important to protect dry land ecosystems as well. Our desert shrublands and even the soil itself right, helps to sequester carbon. Uh, I presume most of you have heard about the concept of cryptobiotic soil. Right? It's these growing cyanobacteria on the surface of our desert lands. They're really important for this purpose because they not only do they sequester the carbon, but they keep the dirt underneath from blowing away. And I'm gonna really dive into some details about why that's important. These ecosystems, like, the, like here in the Colorado Plateau, make a significant contribution of storing these uh, in, the, uh, in the soils to the tune of about 241 million metric tons that these lands can actually that's just here, that's just the Utah wilderness lands right, that can store this if we leave them intact. And that's the important part. They've got to be intact. They can't be disturbed. And if they're disturbed, they lose this quality. Okay. There's a lot to kind of think about here in this terms. Uh, let's, let me dive deeper into this concept of the biotic, cryptobiotic soils because they are really important. Uh, they are living soils. They are a living mat or a seal over the desert that holds the soil in place. They sequester carbon through photosynthesis. They increase soil moisture right, by helping sustain the water supply. They, they hold that water on the surface. They reduce the invasion of exotic plants, which cause a biodiversity problem if you have more exotics. And they sustain the Colorado River by reducing the sand that blows into the atmosphere and covers snow. And I want to kind of explain that a little bit more. These desert soils here in Utah are really important 
because when we disturb them for a wide variety of ways, right, development in all sorts of ways, driving over them, walking over them, when we disturb the cryptobiotic soils, it's been shown that what happens when wind comes in is that now it picks up those dirt that the soils are no longer, the cryptobiotic soils no longer holding down, and they put them up into the air. It's known as a concept of fugi as fugitive dust. Right? And the fugitive dust gets up more so than it used to because we've disturbed the soils more, and it blows. And does the wind blow from Utah? It blows into Colorado, right? And the picture that you're looking at right here shows the southern San Juan Mountains that are covered in red dust. And you might think, well, okay, so why is that a problem, right? Well, it's like wearing a dark shirt on a hot summer day, right? You'll, the darkness absorbs the heat. And what it's causing is problems with the Colorado River flow to the tune of 5% reduction in the Colorado River. The estimates are that if we're gonna continue on this trajectory, the Colorado River flows are gonna continue to decrease seven to even in some models up to 20%. And think about that. Right? If you start really impacting the Colorado River, which of course we already are, right? We see the pictures, we see what Lake Powell's doing, right? Those flows are causing all kinds of problems because 40 million people in the Western United States depend on the Colorado River. It's where 15% of the nation's crops are grown from Colorado River water. And we're doing that. We're causing these problems because of our own desire to you know, have fun, to develop these places, to, to dig fossil fuels. There's a lot of different things that are causing it, but we're responsible to try to fix it. Right? And so what I'm trying to say here, we can have control of these kinds of, of problems and we can make choices. I talk a little bit more about the biodiversity thing. Eli talked about it in terms of wildlife and, and the importance of protecting lands for wildlife. And I think it's a really important aspect of this conversation because we also have control over where wildlife can, can move, right? and they need to move. And I want to throw one quick statistic out to you, that I, and I really want you to think about this one. There are 60% fewer birds in the United States and Canada than there was in 1970. 60% fewer birds. Right? And that's species-wide, right? We're causing that. Right? And that's just an indicator of a bigger problem. And the distribution and the numbers of many wildlife are dependent on our actions. And I like to say that it's the web of life right, that is being unwoven by our actions. And that's why on Earth Day, we need to think about things that we can do here at home to try to affect this. And I, I wrote down a really uh, poignant quote that I'd like to share with you. Uh, and it comes from uh, uh, one of the, kind of the founders of conservation biology, Michael Soule. And he said that this region in Utah, and you can see it here on the map. I, I love this little pointer here because I can point, right? Oh, I, can, I can, can I? No, I can't do it right now. But you can see the, where Utah is in relation to the western United States. The brown areas there on the map are America's Red Rock Wilderness Act. And the kind of the outline there is kind of called the spine of the continent or the western wild way. It's the mountainous zones, right? It's the Rocky Mountains where wildlife moves back and forth from Mexico to Canada. And these migration corridors are really important. And the importance of protecting large landscapes is because it increases the landscape connectivity. So we can piece, if we can piece together larger chunks of wild places, it gives migration corridors and the critters that use them a better chance to survive. It increases genetic diversity, it increases the gene pool, all kinds of reasons behind conservation biology that this is important for protecting wildlife. And this bill really helps tie those things together. But what Sule said on, in regards to the Colorado Plateau, and where you can see it located in the spine of the continent here, is this. And he said, this region, the Colorado Plateau region, is the healthiest, most intact country in the West 
the Colorado Plateau is by and large a connected set of roadless areas that completes a landscape linkage to wildlands in the north, south, and the east. And in the picture here, you can see the light green, kind of lime green colors. Those are the national parks like Yellowstone, Glacier, etc. They're fragmented, right? They're little chunks, right? And by designating wilderness, you help tie the chunks together and give species that migrate through these areas a better chance to live. And this doesn't have to happen just on public lands. Right? We need to conserve large landscape corridors through all kinds of lands, through urban and suburban places, through urban parks, uh, through, through state government, through federal government, through local government, through all kinds of means. We need to connect wild places back together so that we can begin to reweave that web of life. So specifically in Utah, there's five corridors that critters move through that are important, that are linked by the protection of lands in the Red Rocks Bill. One of them is out in the West Desert that connects the Grand Canyon up to the uh, Bitterroot and Sawtooth region up in Idaho. It's the one on the kind of the far left, I, I get left right here mixed up, uh, on the left side of the screen. Uh, the next one is the Wasatch Plateau corridor, which connects, again, the Grand Canyon area up to the Yellowstone and Teton areas, right through the middle of the Colorado Plateau. It's right, it's right behind the school here, right? That's the Wasatch Plateau. A third one is the Green River corridor, which connects kind of the greater Canyonlands area up to the Yellowstone Teton area through the Green River. Uh, and of course, the other one is the big river, the other big river in the area is the Colorado River, so it connects the Canyonlands area up to the Rocky Mountain National Park area in northern Colorado. And then the last one connects the two big monuments down in southern Utah, the Grand Staircase, Escalante, and Bears Ears, over to the southern San Juans. And it's shown that critters migrate through those corridors, but again, the areas on the map are core to those migration corridors. So it's not just about the corridors, but it's and, and the long range sorts of migration that this allows, but it's also important to protect uh, wildlife and against climate change by protecting these kinds of lands because the land itself is conducive to climate refugia. Right? In other words, the land is so topographically different, you know, it's so geographically you know, dramatic that wildlife in these particular lands have a better chance because they can move about in their range to different habitats and escape hot temperatures down low, move up to higher uh, elevations where it's a little cooler. And so these particular lands in Utah, just because of the way the Colorado Plateau is, is important to protect for wildlife and to mitigate climate change by keeping those lands intact. Okay. So, Conservation biology, biodiversity of habitat, uh, protection for wildlife corridors, and protecting against climate change are all big reasons why we need to take a step back and look at what larger landscape protection gives you. I like to say that um, uh, these regions are not just random, right? We didn't just select these places to put into the Red Rocks Bill at random, right? 70 to 80 percent of the lands in the Colorado Plateau and Great Basin are very specifically not currently protected, right? Those are the lands that have been nominated for protection. So we piece them out specifically because of these qualities, because they're important connecting corridors. We looked at the conservation biology drew the maps accordingly. We also drew the maps because they're also the roadless areas. So the two kind of overlap. <clears throat> and that was very specifically done to address these kinds of problems. Excuse me. I want to close by <clears throat> sharing a quote that is one of my favorites. I just want you to take that in for a moment. About 35 years ago, 
when I decided to use my sociology degree from the University of Utah to work on the environmental movement, I saw this quote. I read the book, Sand County Almanac. You should read it too. Uh, and I read this quote, and it just, just jumped out at me. And I actually just wrote it down on a piece of paper. And I kept that piece of paper as a bookmarker, reading a lot of other books over the years. And finally, it started to get pretty crinkled, and I took it and stuck it to my fridge. Right? And it's still there today. And I like to read this quote and look at it because it doesn't really get into too much detail. It just says what's right and what's wrong. So, and, and I think that protecting biodiversity is important for that reason. All right, this is not about you and me. This is about our kids and our grandkids, right? What choice are we gonna leave them if we leave them a planet that's hot and humid and prone to fire and no, you know, much less diversity of wildlife? What, is the, what are we doing? What, are we, what is the choice that we're making today? And I would pose to you that we do have a choice. And Eli went into the detail. Uh, I'm a little bit beyond my years in terms of being able to say this is exactly what we're able to do. Um, but you all have a choice, and I hope that you help to make the right choice in terms of protecting these places. So that's what our Earth Day message is today. I want to also encourage you to get involved. Uh, you can pull out your phone and text the letters ARRWA, stands for America's Red Rock Wilderness Act, to the number on the screen, 52886. You just get in a text message system where we can alert you to things that are going on. You can also go to SUA.org and look at the Get Involved tab to figure out how you can get involved. We also have a stewardship program where you can actually get involved in going out on the ground for a weekend, joining a bunch of other people, most of them are about your age, uh, and hang out in a place, get to see it, and do something good to protect these places on the ground. Get a little dirty. Uh, as Eli said, uh, please fill out the little postcard and uh, in your best handwriting uh, and deposit it in the box on the way out the door today. Um, that's greatly appreciated. Uh, there is inside the packet of information the details of what I kind of went over in very sketchy uh, uh, highlights here. Uh, the role of America's Red Rock Wilderness Act in addressing climate change and biodiversity. There's a packet that's a pull-out packet in and of itself there. That's the detailed report to where we got some of these facts and figures from. You can always reach out to me. I'm real easy to reach. I'm Dave at SUWA.org. Uh, and again, I want to say thank you. Uh, Eli and I are going to open it up to questions now if you want to come back on, up here and ask any questions that you want. Uh, or you can also come to lunch with us because uh, Cheryl and Convocation is uh, treating us to lunch, so we'd love to go spend some time with you there. But yeah, let's open it up, see what kind of questions you got. Maybe Cheryl, you want to start? Oh, no, I'm, I have the microphone, so oh, okay. who would like to ask a question? All right, who's going to be first? Chris, it's over there. All right. So at the beginning of the school year, we had, or semester, we had somebody talk to us about um, nuclear power plants and like salt reactors. And so I was wondering if you guys knew how that could be beneficial or detrimental to the environment and how that might affect with like us trying to use less coal and stuff like that. I do not know about salt fired or salt nuclear plants. I, I'm not familiar with the technology. Um, I think the big thing with nuclear is great source of energy, no question about that. Um, nuclear could power lots of things. Problem is on you have to mine. Um, that has proven to be very, very detrimental to many, many people. Uh, if you go down to the Navajo Reservation just south of here, uh, families are still living with the tailings. Families, their their cancer clusters, higher lines of people have been wiped out. Right? Um, that's a problem on the front end that has to be resolved. And on the back end, what do you do with the waste? Now, maybe this is a technology that doesn't really have the waste where we store that. Um, we really don't have a solution still. Right? The, that waste is still being stored from the plants that are running right today on site. 
um, mostly in the Midwest. So those, those plants have got a lot of waste we don't know what to do with. So again, I don't know the technology. Um, Y'all probably know a lot more about it than I do because you were at the lecture, but um, that's kind of the traditional look at, at nuclear. Uh, uh, it should be, you know, one part of the solution though. Yeah, I would like to uh, mention that, yeah, if done properly, it can be really a really good solution uh, where we're able to like create lots and lots of energy. And I think that's one thing that, that previous convocation speaker mentioned is that we are getting better um, at doing it. So I think that, yeah, as we continue to increase our technology, that's going to be a really big part, really big part of the puzzle for sure. Yeah, so I'd like, yeah, good question, thank you. And, and part of the renewables question is, you know, it needs to be a mix, right? You have to do a little bit of everything. Uh, and, you know, we're, we're getting there, but we're getting there really slowly. And, and one of the reasons we're getting there really slowly is that the fossil fuel industry is so entrenched in the politics that it's really hard to kind of get around. So, unfortunately, it's being thrust upon us, and we're having to react. I think we have time for another question. Um, while you're thinking of your question, would you, if you came in this door, will you please check with the TA on your way out to make sure that your attendance was counted, okay? Any other questions? Come on, don't make it easy on us. Yeah. Um, whoa. Just how closely do you guys try to work with like the DNR and the Forest Service? Are they a key part of like who you're targeting to get these um, policies and bills passed, or are there, or is it just basically straight up out of the state? It's hand and straight to the federal. Well, first off, these are federal lands, so kind of everybody's opinion is welcome. Uh, the state DNR, in particular, is the agency responsible for managing the wildlife. So that's different than managing the land. Right? So they're kind of different responsibilities. Uh, and we do work with the state DNR when it comes to wildlife issues, for sure. Um, the National Forest Service is yet another federal agency. Um, we tend to focus on the Bureau of Land Management just because that's where our, that's where our focus is, we're on the wildlands at BLM. Uh, we do talk to Forest Service, we do comment on some of their policies, specifically when their policies that they're trying to implement are upstream of the BLM lands. So they tend to be kind of the higher elevation, the Forest Service, up in the, where the trees are, and a lot of the water that starts there comes down and flows through the BLM land. So they, we interact with them there a little bit, but in terms of kind of straightforward, like which lands we want to protect, we're focused on the BLM lands. The, those other agencies are kind of uh, apart from that official decision making, but they do affect and we do try to talk to them as well, yeah. Thank you for coming today. Remember to fill out your postcards, okay? and to leave them in the box or to give them to the TAs. Thank you so much for coming. Please, please give them another hand. Thank you.